Today I'm going to talk a little bit off script. I don't generally preach this way. And, and, and as I was putting it together this week, God was just challenging me, Brett, trust me. I've got something to say from your heart. And you know, I like structure, I like notes, and I like all that. And we're, we'll have a little notes, and for those of you who love my notes, we got some. But uh, I just felt like I needed to go ahead and kind of pour it out a little bit about what God has been burdening my heart about and I guess I need to start with the idea that to be better than before, I was thinking through this, this idea that um, as a church, we've, we've acknowledged through the centuries that, that we are not in a world that is at peace. You know, we're in, we're in a world at war, honestly. And it's not an ideological war. It's not a, uh, a war that's political at all, although there's parts of it that are. It's not a racially generated war. It's not a battle of the sexes. There's a, there's a war going on for the soul of mankind and each individual that you see who is made in the image of God. And when you look around the world, you see people who have a face and everybody's face is different. Everybody's, everybody's pigmentation is different on the planet. Everybody's fingerprints are different. But all of us are made and designed in the image of God. And God loves us. He created us uniquely. Just like our fingerprints, just like a snowflake, there's something different about you that nobody else possesses. Now, there is a counterfeiter among us. The Bible describes this, this entity, as, this created being, as the adversary or the Satan, Satan. Or, or another word for him is the accuser, the accuser of the brothers, one who stands against what God wants to do in the world. It's, it's been going on since the Garden of Eden where, you know, man committed the first sin and, and, and we've felt the effects in our world as we have a tendency to go the wrong way. And this entity and this being has been given power. And, 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 and really, the most powerful created being that has ever existed is the Satan. Jesus believed in him. A lot of theologians nowadays don't. They think, well, no, the, the idea of a devil, you know, that's, that's because they were, you know, in their culture, they couldn't explain everything, so they had to use these unseen forces to explain pretty much natural phenomenon like viruses they would see as a devil, but we now know that it's a little bitty part of a cell that gets inside of a cell and causes problems, and so there isn't really a devil out there, and it's kind of like there are many people, even Christian people, when you, t when you start talking about a devil... Or, or an accuser or, or an adversary, they're not very comfortable with that idea because they see us as, you know, everybody's good. Everybody's pretty much good except the people that are just really, really bad. And I, and I just want to come as your pastor just to tell you the truth just a little bit. That Jesus believed that there was, there were, there was, there was an entity that was created that he said he's a liar, He's the father of lies. He's been a liar from the very beginning. When he lies, he speaks his native language. And so I was thinking of all the lies that have been spread through all the, the means of media that we've absorbed over the last few years that have caused so much turmoil and division both in the church and in the world and how it's, it's hard to enter a conversation without talking about one of the divisive issues that we're up against right now. And I was thinking to myself, wouldn't it be good for us as Christian people who know the story of reality, wouldn't it be good for us to pause for just a minute and consider the fact that we are not in a morally neutral world. We have an adversary that wants to steal and to kill and destroy our families. He wants to take the, 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 the good things about us and destroy them and crush them. And he wants us made in the image of God not to love one another but to hate one another and be divided across every kind of tribal line you can imagine. That's what, if there were an adversary in this world, that's what he would be about and see a lot of times a lot of good Christian people have bought into the idea of the, the, the utopian idea that there is something that man if we could just get our philosophy straight if we could just get our political beliefs aligned if we could all just go in the same direction then we would achieve this world that is so much better than the current state of things and, and you've heard the term over the years over the centuries actually these are the progressives 
I'm not talking about liberal, conservative. I'm talking about the people that believe that just around the bend, there's a human solution to the problem that ails humanity. But in that account, they never, ever address this very basic thought that there is an enemy of our soul. And, and the Bible says that our enemy is like a lion seeking whom he may devour. He's like waiting for you to cross his path in order to pounce. And so as we come to this talk today, I, I just wanted you to be aware that we are not in a more morally neutral world. We're in a world at war, but we have been called to fight on the side of good. There are no people sitting on the sidelines, even if you perceive yourself to be on the sidelines you're not you're actually working for the enemy if you're not working for almighty God isn't it crazy to think that way no no pastor isn't there just like a place where I could just settle in and do like be, be a good person but rock, not do bad not do good there's that's not an option you're either living for Jesus or you're not and today we're going to explore what that might look like in your personal life as, as it relates to your calling. I want you to, be, to identify, okay, so if I've got unique fingerprints, if I've got a unique face, if I've got a unique outlook in my brain, the way I look at the world, if it's different, it's there by design. I am not an accident. God planned me for a purpose, for a purpose to do purposes that are good beyond my ability to do them. And so I wanted to just kind of dig into this idea of what is God made me and called me to be? Now, when I talk about calling, I want to just back up a hair and just not make it over-spiritual because it sounds like it, like it is the voice of God, but it comes to us most of the time not through an audible sense of God talking to us. Like, I don't know if you've heard people, and, and maybe you're, you're one of these people that are really confused when somebody says, God told me. That doesn't make sense to you. It's like, I wish God would speak to me that way, Right? And maybe, how many, I don't want to have a show of hands, but I know many of you have felt like that. Like, I'm not sure that God's ever talked to me. But sometimes God will use circumstances. Sometimes will God will use this, this inner urge to push you toward the next good thing. And I'm here to tell you that that is part of God's unfolding his calling in your life. And so no, if you're young or you're old today, God has a calling on your life. He has a thing that he wants from you, for you. Because when you follow in the, that calling, life gets better for you personally because you'll be personally fulfilled, but the world will get better because you're going to be doing something that God would do where he walking in your skin. Is this making sense yet? Because there is an enemy, but God has equipped us to overcome the enemy and overcome the works of the enemy if we'll all do just something that he's asked us to do next. And so in our reading this week, we're reading in 2 Timothy chapter 1. And uh, Paul is exhorting Timothy. Timothy's a young preacher, and he's, he's reminding him who he is. And he says this, For this reason, Timothy, I remind you, fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So somewhere in Timothy's life, Paul put his hands on him and prayed a prayer. Now, it wasn't a Harry Potter magic prayer. It was a Holy Spirit-induced prayer power prayer that God would unleash his power on Timothy and here's what God does when people pray for people and they lay hands on the people God answers and so Timothy was able to receive some kind of impartation from the Holy Spirit that just basically fanned into flame something that was already there it, it wasn't something that started when Paul laid his hands on Timothy it just started to come alive and that's what I know about God's calling in your life. It's not going to be something really weird or far off for you. It might be for somebody else, but for you, it's probably the logical next step. It's kind of like what you're wired to do. He said in verse 7, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So if you want to know the calling for your life, he's saying, Timothy, listen, the, the, the spirit you have in you is a powerful spirit so that when you act with God, God is acting with you. And you've got power to work miracles you, and, and see things happen that shouldn't happen otherwise. And when you do that, you're living in your calling. Now, now most people don't live in a sense of calling. I, I know this. They just pay the bills. They think, how, you know, they count the number of years to retirement. 
They wonder, how, how, am I gonna, how can I afford the next bigger house? How can we make sure our kids get through school? How can we make sure our kids get through school without killing people first, right? I mean, those are important questions to ask yourself, right? Or, you know, but they're, they're not thinking, God put me on this planet for more than just paying bills, for more than just getting by. I'm not just made by God to bump down the river of life in this little happy canoe, right? We're at war. There's no time for spectators. It's like, you know, and I, and I, and I hate, you know, especially with the Taliban in the world, I don't want to compare Christianity to using the same tactics that the Taliban uses. The Taliban uses religious language to control people, and if they don't, you steal something, cut off your hand, right? And it's very, very oppressive. See, the, the, the Christian message when it comes to war is our war is a different kind of war. Our jihad, if you want to use their terminology, is not one of either turn, you know, and convert or die. The Christian jihad is we're going to love people until they can't stand it anymore, till they turn their heart to Jesus. That's our way of war. Our weapons of warfare are not of this world. We do not battle flesh and blood, Paul says, but we do battle spiritual forces. So there is no time for any Christian person living in the United States to take a year off or a day off because you've got an assignment if you are a Christian person. If Jesus Christ died for your sins, there used to be a song that I, had, I picked up when I was a kid in, in, Bible, in vacation Bible school. I'm in the Lord's army, yes, sir. I'm in the Lord's army, yes, sir. Okay, I, I may never march in the infantry flying. The, uh, uh, uh. Anyway, so some of y'all have been around lo long enough you know it. Others of you are s just shut up, old man. Okay. <laughs> I was listening to another song in my head that came up after that one. In my, in, this is when I sang when I was a kid. It just, this, this is way off the track. Um, but do you remember, does anybody remember the story? Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember. You, you remember. Like he could ever forget me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me way beyond the blue. I'm like, how could he forget me? That was such bad theology we told these little kids and that's what I, uh, I learned. Like maybe God's gonna forget me. He can't forget me. Just so you know. So I'm, okay, here's my big question today. What will I do with the life God has given me? I think that's a question that you need to ask. Let's wrestle with as we talk today. Since I know that you probably aren't living in a sense of calling, but maybe many of you say, you know, I see my workplace as a way to express my calling. And I believe that's true for many of you because you're right where God wants you to be in the place, doing what he wants you to do. But there might be more. See, my big idea here is that God has a personal calling for you and I to live out if I'll listen and if you'll listen. Not everybody needs to be a Timothy, you know, to fan into flame this gift, but you need to be you. And, and I find my calling by listening to God and being aware of his power at work through me. Now, it might be a big thing. It might be a small thing. And the first story that came to mind when I was thinking of this was David and Goliath. And that was my first thought was, I'm going to preach a sermon on David and Goliath. And so I, 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 I researched the story again, because it's a very familiar story. But for those of you who are new, let me, let me take you back a little bit. Um, Israel had just become a nation, and they put their first king in charge. His name was Saul. And King Saul was not a great human being. And God decided Saul's had enough of being my king over my people I want the next one to come in and he says hey Samuel I need you to go anoint a new king and Samuel says well wait a minute there's another king and God says I know what I'm doing I need you to go to the house of Jesse and I'm going to show you which guy to anoint he's going to be the next king so he goes to Jesse's house and Jesse's got eight boys seven of them show up and they just go from the oldest to the youngest and they stand there and they, they probably like what the heck is this Here, here's the man of God Samuel coming into our house pretty big deal Samuel walks in and he looks him over one by one and the Lord said, it's none of these guys. 
And I'm sure Samuel was thinking in his head, well, <laughs> you told me to come here. And so he asked his dad, hey, Jesse, do you have another boy? Oh, yeah, I got another one, my littlest one. He's out in the field. His name is David. He goes, bring him in. He said David came in. When David came in, he came in with red hair and, and I don't know, I'm sure freckles too. And um, the Lord said to Samuel, the prophet, he's the one. So Samuel walks over to the youngest child. I'm sure the older brothers were all like, what? You know how you are with your little brother, like, what, him? And Samuel takes the, the flask of oil he had and he broke it over David's head, which is a symbol in that culture for one anointed by God. And basically he's saying, David's going to be the next king. But don't tell anybody because you lose your head when there's somebody else a king and you get anointed king. So you kind of have to keep a lid on this information. So he, they did. So soon after that, they went to war with the Philistines. And the Philistines were on one side of the hill and the Israelites are on one other hill. And there was a valley of Elah right in between. It's still there today. There was a movie made after it. I'm not sure that it had anything to do with this. But the valley of Elah was right there. And there was a Philistine soldier by the name of Goliath. And he walks out every day. And he screams at the Israelite soldiers that are on the other mountain, the army of God, basically, who were doing nothing. He says, hey, you guys, just send one of your guys down here. We'll settle this thing right now. I'll beat every one of you. He's, you know, allegedly nine feet tall, a big boy, and we're going to go with that. And he had his big spear, and he was frightening just the way he spoke. Everybody was terrified. And then David was sent to the front lines to give his brothers, his older brothers, some food. So his dad loads down the donkey, and David walks into the camp. He notices Goliath making all these claims against God in his army. And he looks to everybody else. You guys aren't doing anything. Who is this Philistine that he could come against the armies of God? He was incensed, outraged. He was fired up. And so they said, well, hey, well, you want to fight him? And he goes, what will be given to the man that fights this King, this Goliath and, and they said well go to the king and ask him I think he'll give you his daughter and other stuff and so David's like sounds like a good deal so he goes to the king and the king says hey you know here 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 we go you're a little small I don't think you can do it and he goes no I, I want to give it a shot and so in a strange move he lets him put on his armor to go fight the battle and then he puts Saul's armor on and he says I'm a little guy this is big armor. This is going to slow me down. I'm going to go, just let me take my, my rock and my sling and I'll go fight him. I'm going to kill this guy with, because you know what? God's with me. He's called me to this. Now, I think I've preached it wrong before. I kind of preached it from the point of view where I saw the people that did nothing and said somebody should have stepped up, but only David did. Now I've gotten some more enlightenment. So let me preach it to you right. Um, if any of those other guys would have gone and fought Goliath, they would have got their butt kicked. Because they weren't anointed to beat Goliath. David was. And what I know about me, and what I know about some of you competitive individuals in this room, you constantly compare yourself to people who are living outside your anointing. They're living in their anointing. They may be accomplishing great things and, and, it, and it's caused this unhealthy desire in your heart to want to pursue the life that they have rather than the life that God has given you. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't be the best you, should, you can be, study, work hard, make money. None of that is wrong. But when you start comparing your anointing to somebody else's anointing and that God is not being good to you, but he's being good to them, that's the wrong way to look at the Christian journey. God has called something of you that's unique about you, and you don't have to compare your results to anybody else. David walked into his anointing. He, 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 his anointing. he walked up and he, and he killed Goliath with a sling and a stone. Then he cut his head off. He'll get all video game on him, right, you know? And he, and, he, and he carried Goliath's sword around as a reminder. Not that David was anything special. It was a reminder that God can do anything through anyone who will step up and step into the calling that he's given them. Greater things, Jesus said, 
before he left the earth, he challenged his apostles who had watched him heal people, blind people. He had walked, they, they had raised, they'd see him raise the dead. And he said to them, greater things will you do when I leave this place. The greater things that God has for you, all you have to do is just take step one. And then it will feel like normal. Okay, this is the new normal. I think I'll take step two. Now, I'm two steps from where I was, and now I'm on a different road that's with God and not with this other competition angle that I've had going on in my head. And I know what the devil would love for us all to do if he were around, which I know he is, is he would constantly invite us to compare ourselves with everybody else. Instead of listen to his voice saying, you are my beloved. (laughs) I am pleased with you. I like you how you are. I made you that way. I need you to get better. I need you to do all these things. But you do it in the way that you do it and don't worry about everybody else. And that'd be just a good thing. Because see, David had some preparation for Goliath in his normal course of life when he was a shepherd. One day, he ran into a lion. And apparently... He killed the lion. I've seen lions. I don't think that would be an easy job. They're big and they're faster than me. They're stronger than me. And apparently they're bite, like they would bite holes in every part of my head. That's a lion. I would not fight a lion. That would be somebody else's job. I'm glad David took him up. There was a bear one day. And apparently David killed the bear. Okay, he's two for two. He's big time. This guy's got some hidden talents you know, a little Mortal Kombat, you know, special abilities. I don't know what it is. For those of you who haven't watched the movie, watch the movie. It'll make sense. Anyway. <laughs> and here's what David used as his reasoning that he could kill the giant. Look at this. He says, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. So he knew the Lord was with him the whole time. So he was building a case for why he could fight the hardest, biggest warrior there was anywhere. Because God had done it before in his life, and he'll do it again. And see, God is using your trials of today to prepare you for the triumphs of tomorrow. That's the way it works. He's using the trials of the day to prepare you for the triumphs of tomorrow, provided you stay in his will and not get bitter. Because when you go through trials, there is a path of bitterness, a path of blaming others, a path of getting angry and staying angry, and you can live in anger for the rest of your life when bad things happen. He could have said, yeah, I mean, God sent a lion and a bear had to kill them. I mean... Sure would be nice to be in somebody else's pasture where they don't have lions and bears. What good is God? What's he ever done for me? I had to kill those beasts with my own bare hands. Have you heard people talk like that? In the same set of circumstance, they've gone through life with a different perspective where David was able to say, you know what? What the devil meant for bad God used for good, and he was with me that whole time, and that's what's setting me up from the get up to do this job that he's called me to do. See, some of you are positioned. Your life has been building to this moment. You don't even see it. But if you look back, you can see the dots being connected. Boom, 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 boom. Lions and bears and tigers. Oh, my, you know. (laughs) They're all there. So let me give you some relevant questions to consider about your calling. Here's the first one. What is it that God has given me? What do I have? For Moses, it was a stick. A man named Moses, remember Moses? Here's another big guy in history that we look at and go, man, he was a model. He was a model eventually, but he didn't start out that way. After he was leading all the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery. Remember, Moses is the guy that went to Pharaoh, let my people go. The Prince of Egypt, the movie's all about that, if you've seen it, okay? Just if you haven't read the Bible, you've probably seen the movie, something like that. Okay, so he leads the Israelites out of Egypt where they were slaves. He had no military power, just the power of God. 
acting on his behalf, and he leads them outside of Egypt. They're heading to the promised land. God had promised them a land. But before they could get to the promised land, there was the Red Sea right in front of them, like the side of an ocean, right? So they're looking at this going, well, I guess we could go around. We can go south and go that way. About the time they're planning to go south, they look behind them, and Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, had sent an army to recall his slaves. It was like a recall election in California. Let's get them back. And Moses looks back. He sees the army. They're a bunch of slaves. They don't have weapons. How are they going to fight? He cries out to God. And God said to him, listen to this, what are you crying out to me about? Now, I think this is a great time to cry out, don't you? The enemy's behind you. You got the ocean in front of you. Where are you going to go? He says, you tell the people to move on. (laughs) And as a leader, I'm thinking, well, God, you didn't give him much to go on there. (laughs) Here's the deal. A long time before, if you follow the dots back, Moses was a shepherd. For 40 years, he spent in the wilderness, and he had a stick with him. The stick went everywhere with him. He was like a staff. He would walk with it. He would, you know, fend off the the bad animals, I guess. I don't know. But it was always with him. It was always in his hand. And God said, Moses, what's in your hand? It's a rod. I walk with it. He said, no, Moses, it's no longer just a stick. It is now going to be called the rod of God. (laughs) Well, it's just, can you imagine He'd already, he'd overlooked this thing all his life. But when you connect the dots back to his shepherding, and now what is he doing with all these millions of Israelites? He's shepherding them. And what has he got in his hand? Well, the same thing he used to use now is the rod of God. So he, God says, raise the rod over the water. And he did. And the water divided. The Red Sea was able to divide. And, and the Bible says, Moses opened a way for them on a road that they didn't know was there. It was a hidden road. The Israelites go through, and right as Pharaoh's army is trying to take the same trek, the water collapses around them, and if you've seen the movie, it's kind of, you know, kind of gory. Bad to be Pharaoh's team on this one. And, uh, but the Israelites made it through on the other side. So what's in your hand? What is it that you're thinking, that's not much. But see, your little in the hands of God becomes way more than enough. But it has to be his. And we talked about that a little bit last week. And I hope that you've kind of considered your resources as part of what you already have. But secondly, when I have the opportunity to serve, ask yourself this question. Do I lean toward faith or fear? Do I, oh gosh, I can't do that. I don't have the time. I'm afraid that I just don't have the, you know, what it takes I'm too old for that. I'm too young for that. When I have the opportunity, do I lean to faith or fear? Do I just say, you know what? I'm going to serve God first, and then he's going to have to make a hole in my calendar for other things. And so you have to begin to think that way. The third thing is this. What holy burn has God placed in my heart? You have to ask that question. If you want to understand your calling, because there's certain things that really get under your skin, certain things that bother you. And David was distressed when he heard Goliath's words. I get bothered when I know that people want to be Christian in name, but they don't do anything with it. They just, like, I give God an hour a week, if that. That bothers me. That's a burn. So how do I affect that change in that, that small burn? I invite our church to go with me on a one-year journey through the New Testament where they're going to find God's voice every single morning when they wake up in his word. That's a burn in my heart that has been there for you so that you go from being this level of Christian to this. Because not only is knowledge going to serve you well when you read God's word, it's going to propel you into the path that God has for you. Your unique calling is found in the pages of God's word because you're going to see people a whole lot like you in there. And they're going to be doing things like you do it. And they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can do that 
too. And it might be something you think, well, my calling, I don't know that, I don't want to be a pastor. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't, I don't, you don't have to work at a church. Last night I was talking over at the splatter paint deal with one of the parents, Dan Sherritt. And uh, he said, Pastor, I don't know if you know this. He said, I got a couple kids southeastern and, you know, one here tonight. But I've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old. We went into adoption. I was like, oh, that's awesome. He goes, well, you preached a sermon about five years ago and you had people in the lobby that were with adoption agencies and guardian ad litem and then there were some people from, that uh, had foster care. And so we just felt the nudge to become foster parents, to explore that. And he said, it wasn't really a calling because that sounds really super spiritual. It was just like, you know, we ought to do that. We had already raised kids but God was just asking us to just take this step of faith and investigate it. So they investigated it and they became foster parents. In the process somewhere, and I didn't get all these details, so I'm kind of giving you the 70,000 foot view. In the process, they felt the nudge to adopt. And so they had a couple of, uh, 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 they have a, now they have a four-year-old and a two-year-old and both of them have different special needs. And uh, it, just to go along with, I mean, just not only is adopting difficult, they went to the next level because they felt like God was inviting them to share in the suffering in this world and bring, and bring beauty out of the ashes. And, um, and he's so humble about it. He said, it has been so hard, but it's been so good. And you know, when you do things in your calling, it's kind of like that. In fact, I, I want to read a passage of scripture kind of to, to illustrate this. It's at the end of the book of Colossians where Paul begins to give a shout out to the people that have helped him. Look at this, real life people. You only hear about these people once. Tychicus, it says in verse seven of chapter four in Colossians, Paul is saying, he'll give you a full report about how I'm getting along. He's a beloved brother and a faithful helper who serves me in the Lord's work. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, to let you know how we're doing and, and to encourage you. So he's saying, look at Tychicus. He's a good guy. I'm sending him to you. He's walking in his calling. And basically, what's he doing? He's being a messenger. He's taking time out of his job to go from one city to the next to tell him how Paul is doing and how the good news is getting out. It's pretty cool. He said, I am also sending Onesimus, I love these names, a faithful and beloved brother, one of your very own people. He and Tychicus will tell you everything that's happening here. So Onesimus and Tychicus, they form a team and they go out and live in their calling. And then Aristarchus, who's in prison with me. Aristarchus, man, he must have done something bad. No, he just did what Paul did. And so does John Mark send their greetings. Barnabas, Barnabas's cousin, as you were instructed before, make Mark welcome if he comes your way. Jesus, the one we call Justice, they couldn't call him Jesus because they already had one of those. They called him Justice, like, you can't have that name. Hey, just, we're going to call you Justice. Also sends his greetings. These are the only Jewish believers among my co-workers. They're working with me here for the kingdom of God. Look at this. And what a comfort they have been. Do you know when you share the load with someone in some way in a Christian sense, you become a comfort to them? Because serving the Lord is hard. Last night, that party and all the details for 12, 1,300 kids, it's nuts how many, and we had so many volunteers there. Thank you for staying up late and for putting things away. It, it's work, serving the Lord. And that's what we're talking about right here. Epaphras, a member of your own fellowship and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. L listen to this one. He always prays earnestly for you. So there's another calling. Not only is there some people sent to tell good news, there's some people around to be comforters. Now this guy, Epaphras, prays. He always prays earnestly for you, asking God to make you strong and perfect, fully confident that you are following the will of God. I can assure you that he prays hard for you and also for the believers in Laodicea and Hierapolis. So our first Wednesdays, the reason we have first Wednesdays in this room on Wednesday night, we do a little time of worship and then we just pray. Some of you are gifted and called by God 
to be prayer warriors, to be intercessors. You definitely need to be here. Others of you need to explore that calling because every time a need comes up, you feel yourself nudged by the Holy Spirit to begin to pray for that need. I need you to come around on Wednesday night and explore that calling and find out more. The rest of you just need to pray because all God's people need to pray, amen? It'd be cool to have this many folks on Wednesday night. And that says in verse 14, Luke, the beloved doctor, sends his greetings as does Demas. Please give my greetings to our brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church that meets in her house. Okay, here's another one. Here's another calling. Nympha had a house. And instead of going, I don't want to clean up my house tonight, she said, y'all come on in. She had the gift of hospitality. She was exploring her calling to open her home. You see, a calling doesn't mean everything I do is going to be out there for the world to see. A calling is what God has made you do, equipped you to do. And when you do that thing, it makes the world better. It defeats the plan of darkness. Darkness cannot win when God's people do what they are called to do because the rest of the world who is caught living in darkness see the opposition forces that we are, the forces of love, the forces who gather together to hear God's word preached on a weekly basis, who gather together to worship the one and the only Jesus Christ who gave his life for us. We are a different and set apart kind of people we are a world at war we are God's warriors for sure but our war making is love making in a Christian sense of the way and we are going to do what God has asked us to do amen you are called to do great things by God and when I define my calling there's four words it's sacrificial it's going to cost me something to pursue my calling it'll cost you something but it'll be worth it Secondly, it'll be unknown. I don't know what's at the end of this. I just take the next step. And when I'm in the unknown, that's a walk by faith and not by sight. And it will be a call, thirdly, to serve. When you explore a calling, it's always for the good of other people. Did you know that? A Christian calling is not so that your name goes up in lights. It's so others are blessed by your life. Isn't that good? You become a light everywhere you go and then it's fulfilling lastly this is one I want to hit on hardest when you pursue God's calling it sustains you the way that maybe working for a dollar doesn't if you're wondering if there's more to life you've 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 got all the trophies you've attained all the goals that you ever wanted to hit if you're wondering if there's more to life I, I just urge you to consider God's calling on your life. See, he's got a personal calling for you. So what will you do with the life God has given you? At, at church, we have a way of exploring this and on, on our classes and next step classes come up next Wednesday, not this Wednesday, but the following. We have three weeks I'm talking about what the church is about, but week number three is about your spiritual giftings and your shape. Like you have spiritual gifts. You, you need to know what they are. You also have a heart that, that beats for certain things and abilities that other people don't have and a personality that's a little bit different and experiences that nobody else has. And I just think God has woven all of that together in you and you need to get to know yourself in a spiritual sense, amen? So I invite you to join me in a few weeks for that class. But in the meantime, I'm gonna ask you to stand with me to change your position. I want the band to come out and bow your heads. Would you do that for me? And uh, I just want you to pray this prayer with me. As I pray it, if, if you agree with it, just say, me too, God. Our Father, I thank you for my life. I thank you for my eternal life that you've given me through the death and resurrection of your son. I do want my life to count. I do want to pursue the calling that you've given me. I, can, I confess that sometimes I'm on the sidelines because I don't know what to do next but I commit to finding the next step. I don't need to know the end of the journey. That's for you to tell me later. I just need to know the next step. So God, would you guide me in that? And Lord, we know that we're part of the army of light. We want this world to be better. We wanna see the effects of the devil be destroyed. 
Because that's what you came to do, Jesus, to destroy the work of the devil. So Lord, help us help you in that. Purify our hearts that we're able to see clearly what's next. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.